Jamil Giovanni wins the Durham riding by-election. Dan Kearns, The Standard, Durham. Jamil Giovanni will replace Aaron O'Toole as the Durham Riding's Member of Parliament after winning a by-election on Monday, March 4th. Mr. Giovanni, the Conservative Party candidate, won the election with 57.4% of votes cast. The total votes he received was 18,610. There are many Conservatives, like me, who acknowledge in 2024 it is our party that best represents the values of our communities, said Jamil Giovanni during his acceptance speech. He added, if I have learned anything from Pierre Polliver, it is the importance of focus and discipline, so we can get the job done and change this country. Coming in second place was Liberal Party candidate and current Scugog War three councillor Robert Rock. He received 7,285 votes, which is 22.5% of the votes cast. I'm overjoyed with the campaign. I think we worked really hard, and to me, the biggest thing I wanted to get out of this was to be able to look back and have zero regrets. I have to say, the campaign we put together, the work we put in, I have absolutely no regrets with what we did, Mr. Rock told the Standard. Yes, it wasn't the result we hoped for, but that is up to the will of the voters. From our perspective, we did everything we could possibly do to have a positive outcome today. The NDP's Chris Borgia finished the by-election with 3,363 votes, which was 10.4% of the votes cast. PPC candidate Patricia Conlin received 1,435 votes, and Green Party candidate Kevin McKenzie received 698 votes. Independent candidate Prane Gunte received 374 votes, and Centrist Party candidate Khalid Qureshi received 336 votes. 238 people voted for United Party of Canada candidate Grant Abraham and 62 people voted for Rhinoceros Party candidate Adam Smith. Voter turnout was listed at 27.8% of the over 116,000 eligible voters in the riding. Uxbridge seeking input on age-friendly initiatives. Daryl Knight, The Standard. Uxbridge. Promoting and enhancing the work done by the township's age-friendly committee was at the forefront of a recent council meeting with the suggestion funds be allocated to improving initiatives for a significant portion of the community. Age-friendly committee chair Kathy Clulo appeared before council at their meeting on the morning of Monday, February 26th to outline the work done by the committee to date, as well as the plans to promote Uxbridge as an age-inclusive location. During the question portion of the meeting, regional councillor Bruce Gerard put forth the idea the township could look at directing funding for age-friendly initiatives. If we could commit to X dollars per year, targeted specifically to age-friendly initiatives, what would you do? asked Councillor Gerard. The committee replied, if there were a dedicated commitment which could be counted on each year, it could allow the committee to accomplish the significant goal of establishing a dedicated non-profit entity to undertake matters such as applying for grants which are currently done by township staff. Under this scenario, that work, as well as any follow-up work to be done to receive those grants, would be done by a part-time coordinator whose sole focus would be enhancing age-friendly initiatives for the betterment of the entire community. Councillor Gerard also noted the number of seniors living in Uxbridge is more than 50% higher than the average in Durham Region. As a whole, the region's population of citizens who are 65 years and over is approximately 14%. In Uxbridge, that number is 21.7%. The Age-Friendly Committee is undertaking a community survey until Sunday, March 31st, to gather opinions and experiences related to aging in Uxbridge. The survey will allow participants of all ages to provide feedback on several areas of life in Uxbridge, including public building access and washrooms, outdoor spaces, health services transit, housing, and other community services, as they relate to the aging population. Ward 5 Councillor Todd Snooks praised the work of local seniors in his comments, as well as promoting improved access to the survey in rural Uxbridge. When I'm out in our community at different events, commented Ward 5 Councillor Todd Snooks, it is seniors who I see as our top volunteers in this township. Thank you to them. Councillor Snooks also suggested hard copies of the age-friendly survey be placed at locations around the township, including community halls in Sanford, Goodwood, and Zephyr to reach as many residents as possible by providing access where seniors are already meeting.
The survey is available on the Township website at www.uxbridge.ca or www.surveymonkey.com forward slash r forward slash agefriendly Uxbridge until Sunday, March 31st. Paper copies are available throughout Uxbridge Township at Town Hall, the Senior Center, both branches of the Uxbridge Public Library, Uxpool, and the Community Centers. You can also request a paper copy and receive further information by contacting Chris Gilmore at 905-852-3081 or Chilmore, C-H-I-L-M-O-U-R, at uxbridge.ca. Brock looks to Beaverton's future with new waterfront plan. Daryl Knight, The Standard, Brock. Councillors recently endorsed a waterfront plan which provides a long-term vision for Beaverton's waterfront and the lands which provide a crucial connection between downtown and the harbour. Over the past 14 months, the municipality has engaged in a comprehensive public consultation program. This included a series of workshops, open houses and meetings to obtain valuable stakeholder contributions from the community. The result of all this community engagement is a remarkably comprehensive document which brings together many components and features from the different concept options which were developed through the process. The Waterfront Plan presents a crucial framework for guiding the detailed design of more than 40 component projects. These are from across five focus areas, the harbour, the fairgrounds, railway parcels, Mill Gateway Park, and downtown Beaverton. The Waterfront Area and Open Space Plan will be used to help guide future projects within the Township's annual budget and business plan. Township staff also explained they will be able to use the plan to explore external opportunities for funding, such as grants, as they become available. The matter was discussed at the Council meeting on Monday, February 26th. Once the plan was formally endorsed by Council, Regional Councillor Mike Jubb questioned how the municipality prepares for the possibility of grants becoming available as they relate to the areas identified by the plan notably tourism and economic development. Township staff noted the plan being endorsed by Council is a significant step and will enable staff to look at those grants more closely and act quickly when they become available to the municipality. Brock has already begun phasing in projects such as identifying the replacement of washroom facilities at Beaverton Harbour in the next five years. There are also longer-term projects which will enhance the community in the future including a band shelf for the fairgrounds or Mill Gateway Park, and an enhanced riverwalk feature in Mill Gateway Park and downtown. More information on the waterfront plan can be found online at letstalkbrock.ca forward slash waterfront dash plan. TLDSB tackles mental health and new strategy plan. Dan Kearns, The Standard, Kawartha Lakes. The Trillium Lakelands District School Board, TLDSB, has taken a step to address the issue of mental health board-wide. At a board meeting on Tuesday, February 27th, Acting Associate Superintendent of Learning, Tanya Fraser announced, a three-year mental health and addiction strategy and a one-year action plan have been developed. We are committed to the promotion of everyday mental health strategies, equipping students, staff, and their caregivers with the knowledge to identify if a child is experiencing mental health concerns, using collaboration to build strong home and community connections, and amplifying student voice and leadership in mental health, Superintendent Fraser told trustees. She noted, through surveys and forums, the board has found students want to learn about mental health at school, and stress and anxiety are real and growing concerns for them. The board is also taking a statistical approach to this issue. School attendance is linked to well-being, and we are examining attendance trends across the district, Superintendent Fraser said. Overall, she stressed, through this initiative, the board must be committed to improving well-being for all. Actions Speak Louder Than Words by Tina Y. Gerber McCurley As Christians, we are called to be content, to discover gratefulness, patience, gratitude, and love. There is so little we need in life if we trust God's faithfulness. God speaks into every area of our lives, so we can see His truth and understand, in obedience to God, He will provide for us. True kindness is loving others as ourselves, and forgiving their trespasses as God forgives us. I was at the intersection on the Island Road by my church, PPBC, 
this past January, and a young man was standing there with a sign asking for money for his family. We have been struggling with finances, so we understand the struggle is real. Something compelled me to drop my last five dollars into his bucket. I felt so much better knowing I made a difference in his day. As he said, God bless you, I drove away feeling so blessed and thankful. I told Martin, and he said, That's nice. God will bless your kindness. Another time when I was on my own, years ago, and down to my last five dollars, my youngest wanted to go to a mills for french fries and a cup of tea, while her older sister was out having her own adventure. I ordered a coffee, her tea, and french fries. Oh, we had a great time. We could both get refills, and in the happiness of her excitement, she asked if she could get gravy for her fries. Giggling, we ordered gravy. A few minutes later, it struck me the gravy would put me over my $5 budget. What should I do? I didn't have the heart to disappoint her or allow her to think we didn't have enough. I said a silent prayer, and the food arrived. She was the one who said grace. She was six years old, and we began to eat the fries. They were so good. I left this in God's hands. He answered me. The lady at the table next was so moved by Emily's prayer, she leaned over the booth and put something in my hand. She said, It's for the little girl. It's not much, but hearing her say grace moved my soul. That rarely happens these days. Some might call this a miracle, or fortunate, but I know it was God's provision for us because we trusted in Him to meet our needs. When I went to pay, I left the entire balance as a tip for the waitress. This is God's way of providing blessing all around, when we ask and listen as well. A former teacher, Miss Susan Atterley, allowed us to stay at her cottage one summer, when my daughters were young. Other friends, Ken and Teresa, lent us their trailer the following year and parked it at Emily Provincial Park. Whether you are 5, 25, 45, 65, or 85, kindness never gets old. Kindness is the most valuable thing in our world, not to mention throughout history. The positive effect of kindness will help improve your mood, and you are more likely to pay it forward. I have been blessed by the drive through at Tim Hortons, and have also paid it forward when I can. A small act of kindness can go a long way. Kindness is an act of service to bless another heart. It can be as simple as holding the door open for someone, getting a friend a gift card, greeting visitors to your church, or sending a good morning text. A few weeks ago, I was attempting to cross the snowbank in front of Foodland on Queen Street, and I didn't have my cane. A gentleman came over and offered me his hand as he'd seen me struggling. That meant more to me than a million dollars. I believe every small act can put the world on a better path. It's a great idea to spread kindness and joy whenever you can. Sometimes this one act of kindness will give you hope again. Welcome to You've Got to Be Kidding, a podcast that offers a different perspective of life around us. Listen now to author Jonathan Van Bilsen. Thank goodness I was not born on February 29th of a leap year. Although I'd only be in my teens, I would have missed out on many birthday presents and parties. The concept of leap year, adding an extra day to the calendar every four years, has its roots in ancient civilizations' attempts to synchronize the lunar and solar calendars. Early calendars were based on the lunar cycle, which consists of approximately 354 days. However, the solar year, based on the Earth's orbit around the Sun, is about 365 and a quarter days. This discrepancy led to seasonal drifts, causing festivals and agricultural events to fall out of sync with the actual seasons. I thought it was a relatively recent addition to our calendars, but apparently the ancient Egyptians were among the first to recognize the need for a leap year around 4,000 years ago. They added an extra day to their calendar every four years to align it more closely with the solar year. Similarly, the ancient Greeks proposed a cycle of 19 years, including seven leap years to reconcile lunar and solar calendars. Boy, I'm glad that did not stick around as I'd have no idea what date it was. The Romans further refined the concept of leap year with the introduction of the Julian calendar in 45 BCE under the rule of Julius Caesar. The Julian calendar established a 365-day year with an extra day added every four years, making it a leap year. 
It seemed to work great until someone discovered the Julian calendar was about 10 days ahead of the solar year. To address this issue, Pope Gregory XIII introduced the Gregorian calendar in 1582. Most Catholic countries adopted the Gregorian calendar immediately, while Protestant and Eastern Orthodox countries adopted it later. For instance, Great Britain and its colonies did not adopt the Gregorian calendar until 1752, resulting in an 11-day adjustment. Russia adopted it even later in 1918. Today, the Gregorian calendar is the most widely used civil calendar worldwide, and the concept of leap year remains crucial for keeping our calendars in sync with the Earth's orbit around the Sun. While minor adjustments may be necessary in the distant future to account for the remaining discrepancy, leap years continue to play a vital role in maintaining the accuracy of our calendars. I personally would like to propose a metric calendar, along with metric time. 10 months would make up a year and 10 days would be a one month. Each hour would have 100 minutes and there would be 10 hours in a day. If you agree with this viable concept, please let me know. Maybe we could call it John's Excellent Time Concept. I'm Jonathan Van Bilsen and this is You've Got to Be Kidding. You've Got to Be Kidding was presented by X4 Media with permission from the Standard Media Group. We endeavor to make all information contained in this program as accurate as possible at production time. X4 Media and the Standard Media Group are not responsible for any liabilities resulting from information contained in this program. For more information, please visit x4media.ca. The Standard Podcast was produced by Greenstream Studio for The Standard Newspaper.